Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the NetChoice live webinar, Fighting the Virus Online, how tech platforms are helping communities stay connected and stop the spread of COVID-19. Once again, thank you very much for showing up. We got a great panel for you. Uh, we're gonna skip over introductions because I find them boring, which means you'll most likely find them boring and we'll just kind of jump right in. But before you do that, I will let you know who is joining us today. So I'm Carl Zabo, I'm the Vice President and General Counsel of NetChoice. We have Sarah Broma, who is the Head of Policy for Pinterest. Lauren Culbertson, who is the Senior Manager of Public Policy at Twitter. And Katie Oyama, who's the Global Director of Government Affairs at YouTube. And look, I'm gonna use the cliche, it's unprecedented times in which we live in. Congratulations, I've said the obvious. But what does that really mean for us? Uh, how have we been able to stay connected but stay at home? Because in these unprecedented times, we have unprecedented technology that's kind of making this really tough, bad experience a little bit more bearable. And that's what we really wanted to talk to everyone here today. So one of the things that we found is that the uses of these technologies have really changed in a lot of ways. And, uh, you know, Sarah, let, let's start with you. Many of the aspects of this pandemic are unprecedented. And have you seen any real changes in the way that users are leveraging Pinterest to get information or just make their lives better? What have you seen in, with respect to the changes? Yeah, sure. And, and thanks for having me. I think, um, more than ever before in Pinterest history, people are coming to the platform to search and save and send ideas for how to get through this time. Uh, we've actually seen record high engagement from both existing users and new users. Um, and our pinners are coming to, to search for ideas on how to how to cope with, with the situation we're finding ourselves in, like how to educate and entertain their kids and um, how to clean their house during quarantine and what food to put in their pantry and how to make face masks. Um, and also how to give back to their communities and, and thank healthcare workers. Um, as a mom of two very young kids and working full time, I've definitely been using it to try to find ideas on, on what to do with my children and how to entertain them. And um, last week, trying to find ideas on how to virtually thank their preschool and kindergarten teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week, because never had to do that virtually before. Um, so that's that's really how we're seeing people use it, just you know, really high engagement and people searching for ideas on, on how to to cope with this time and, and some novel ideas for, for what to do with their time at home. Yeah, I mean, teacher appreciation. I mean, I've got two small kids. I certainly miss schools, uh, you know, trying to figure out how do you say thank you when you're not there to give them a gift basket or put up a poster for them. It, it's, it's been really, really tough. Um, but, you know, one of the things that my wife actually did with respect to Pinterest was find some really cool ideas on how we can give back. Uh, you know, Katie, as, as we're dealing with kind of the shelter in place orders and stuff like that, YouTube, I'm sure, has seen a lot of demand, but some changes in the way that people are using YouTube from, from the days of just two months ago. Thanks, Carl. Um, hi, everyone. I think that's exactly right. Um, as we We've seen so much of the population shelter in place, um, really stay connected over the internet. Um, we are seeing some of those same um, increases in usages. So, you know, one thing I would say, I'm at YouTube now, but I think across the entire company, there's um, a huge amount of work being done on um, ensuring that our platforms are being used responsibly, that authoritative, um, important health information is being surfaced. Um, I'll, I'll turn a little bit to some of the lighter uh, moments just, just for a moment, because we are seeing a really um, interesting shift. Um, both um, channels and institutions that had already had a large YouTube presence, I think, are relying on that even more. But one of the really positive, nice things that we've seen is that institutions um, like theater or ballet that um, maybe weren't using their channels as much have also been really reaching their audiences and looking at their archives. So. And see, so you have a couple examples here. The first one that you have was with Dr. Fauci. Um, you know, we're really seeing governments around the world, you know, both in the United States at the state and local level, at the federal level, 
um, rely on services like YouTube as well as internationally. So the CDC has a channel, um, the World Health Organization has a channel, and we have seen um, public health institutions turn to some of our creators and personalities on YouTube because they do realize that to transmit really important public health information, um, you know, many governments are trying to reach as broad populations as they can. So this was one that Trevor Noah uh, hosted with Dr. Fauci an interview, um, and Dr. Fauci has met with um, many different creators, Lily Singh, um, Phil DeFranco, and a number of others to help get factual information out to audiences that might not um, typically look at it. And I think you also had a slide, Carl, that was um, a snapshot of a recent, a uh, couple of recent um, music concerts that we've seen. So obviously um, in this time, you know, one of the um, really unfortunate effects of this shelter in place orders has been um, many musicians, artists, communities that would generally gather in person have not been able to do that. And um, we are seeing a lot of those um, artists also reach their audiences. So this was, um, Post Malone actually did a concert um, from home that raised, I think on the right, that's the donate button. So, so far it's raised almost $5 million for COVID relief, mm -hmm. but it was um, a Nirvana tribute. Um, we saw a lot of engagement there. And then I think the other one you had might've been, um, Andrea Bocelli was another, in interesting international example on Easter, um, he performed live. So we're seeing a lot of uses of live streaming. Um, we published a playbook about that. And so far, I think this has 40 million views. It was viewed um, all around the world and it was um, broadcast live from um, Milan, the Duomo on, on Easter. So seeing that connectedness across communities has been, I think at this time, one of the um, uplifting pieces that we've been fortunate to see. And, it, you know, I started playing some of these videos, especially this one, and uh, I got very excited. And then my kids were asking, who's Nirvana? And that, that was a little uh, disheartening for me. But but it hasn't been all, all clean. Like, you've definitely seen some challenges arise with respect to, you know, what's going on. You've had to change your business model. You've had to change some of the practices that you engage on to to kind of update with the times like you know lauren what what type of changes have you seen going on with respect to twitter under the the new upsurge and uptick in viewership and and usage sure absolutely um and to echo some of the things that have been said i mean it's been really incredible to see how people are using the platform to connect um and just one other Thing that we've seen out there since uh, mid-March, we've seen 265 million tweets that talked about gratitude um, or, um, or related terms. And so you're also seeing a lot of kind of people banding together uh, to help spread positivity and to support each other. Um, and in terms of like how things have changed, um, when this all started breaking, um, the end of January, we actually launched a prompt. It's called, we use it, there is help. And this was um, something we sprung into action and now have deployed in over 80 countries where if people go to Twitter to search for coronavirus, COVID-19, they're met with authoritative information from their in-market source. So here in the CDC, here in the United States, it's the CDC. Um, so that's just one thing that we did very quickly um, operationally. But the other things that we've done um, we've had to be very flexible and nimble because obviously this is a new unprecedented challenge. Um, one thing that was a immediate effect during the shelter in place orders is we had to reconfigure our workforce. Um, so this obviously impacted our agents and our agent capacity. And so we had to think about how to uh, reframe that and shape it. Um, and we're also leveraging technological tools in a way that we haven't before to, to make sure that people are safe on the platform to um, enforce our, our Twitter rules. Um, I'll pause there. Yeah, no, thanks. And, you know, one of the things that, that we like to celebrate is how people are being helpful. You mentioned that, Lauren. Uh, you know, famously, we had the ice bucket challenge, which was people using technology for good to be helpful. Um, and, and, you know, Sarah, Pinterest has always been a really positive location. It's been really helpful for people like my wife to become inspired to do built-ins in our house. So now we've got 
construction equipment and Ikea all over the place. What are some of the positive experiences that, that you've been seeing on Pinterest? Um, yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, Pinterest, like you mentioned, is all about bringing people inspiration to create a life they love. That's our company's mission. Um, and inspiration can come in lots of different forms. And obviously, it's very personal to people. So, um, but we think right now, inspiration is kind of more, more important than ever to really help people figure out how to live their lives right now, um, but also try to stay connected to themselves and feel positive. And even if they're not with their friends and family, to stay connected with their friends and family. Um, one of the things that we did to try to make sure we are trying to help people stay stay inspired right now and um, find ideas is we um, pulled up the launch of a new feature we have called the Today tab. Um, I think you might have a, a slide of that. You can think of the Today tab as kind of like a daily source of inspiration with curated topics and uh, trending pins to make it easy to find ideas to live your life right now. Yeah, here it is. Um, every day, actually, the different there's different topics that come up. Um, I just saw one on how to host a virtual prom, for example, because you see so many college or high school yep. seniors trying to figure out how to how to have the rest of their high school years um, when they're when they're staying home. Um, so that's one thing we did that in March. We launched that um, that, and we're every day again. There's there's new topics that are coming up. Um, a lot about how to you know bake with your kids and ideas on quick and easy meals to make and so forth. Um, and also encouraging mental health and well being is really top of mind for us at Pinterest, and especially. You know, right now, um, this spring, we saw searches for calming quotes double and stress relief triple. Um, and we are really seeing people trying to figure out how to cope right now with a new challenging reality that they have. Um, and this is Joshua. Uh, he's a pinner in Austin, Texas. Um, and he shared with us that he's a lifelong sufferer of depression and anxiety. Um, and he's been using Pinterest to create different boards to help him with his um, his mental health. Um, he has boards on like how to stay calm and um, you know, make himself laugh and how to cheer himself up. Um, he also has virtual travel boards. So even if he's not able to travel either due to the, the current pandemic or just from his, um, his own, um, health challenges, he's able to create boards of different places that he really wants to visit. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing other people do that right now. Um, but we actually, because of, you know, people trying to cope right now and, and really trying to, to keep themselves positive while they're dealing with some really difficult um, feelings and emotions. We rolled out, um, expanded the rollout of our compassionate search. Um, I think there's a, a shot of that too. It's our mental wellness feature, and we made it more widely available across all platforms. And so now people can look at it from desktop or their phone. Um, and what it looks like is if you search for quotes like stress relief or um, anxiety, the types of things we saw increasing in the spring, it brings up options to check out um, different emotional well-being activities that help you, um, you know, work through your emotions or make you feel better or maybe relax. Um, and these we we helped develop, um, or the uh, mental health experts at Stanford helped us develop these. Um, so now you can do it from your computer or your, from your phone. Um, and that's one way we're trying to, you know, to bring these features to more of our users right now. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's not just users, but it's a lot of different industries that, that you guys are helping. I mean, I went and picked up a brunch from a local place down the street and, you know, I was talking to the owner and they're talking about how they're struggling and how it's really tough. I mean, you know, Katie, can you talk about some of the things that you guys are doing to help some of the local industries and, and um, some sure. of the, some think, of the other uh, businesses you know, there really connect? Are pretty much in every sector and every vertical businesses that are shifting through a buy on digital, whether it's to um, sell their goods over the internet, to have customer reviews, to um, deliver content. Um, I think we might have one slide on um, an upcoming film festival that we're doing. So some of the leading film festivals that we would normally be seeing um, at Sundance or Khan, Venice Film Festival, those have been also canceled for the shelter in place. So um, this was something that the film industry got behind. It was spearheaded by the Tribeca Film Festival um, in New York, and it'll be launching at the end of May. It's going to be, um, it's called We Are One, and it's a film festival that will connect and surface um, films from all around the world. There's about 20 different film festivals from Tokyo to Sydney to Tel Aviv um, that are all involved, and so that should be um, a really interesting way to surface the content, and there'll be some master classes and interviews with some of the directors. Um, if you're a Parasite fan, I think there'll be some content there. Um, so, so that's one place. Um, I think for, for educators, we're also seeing, um, obviously for, for parents and for teachers, um, a much greater reliance on the internet to reach students. So 
Um, this is a learning hub that, that YouTube has had. Um, you can kind of customize the content based on your child's age or demographic. Um, we also built a microsite for um, improving the ability to learn at home. And so that can range from, um, I was looking, there was like an AP history class that I think Lin-Manuel Miranda led a master class for. Oh, wow. Like uh, PE classes, dance breaks, um, science, math. So, so everything from kind of the, um, the light to the to more serious. But there are, I think, um, the stat is like 1.6 billion students around the world are now homebound. Um, during shelter in place. So I think surfacing, you know, as much educational content, um, both for parents for managing many things and also for students who um, are looking and curious about different areas has been um, one of those success. Yeah, I mean, it, it, as any parent or student will tell you, like the, the educational system was not designed for this and it was thrust upon them essentially over a weekend, uh, we got noticed that schools are closed. So all of a sudden, teachers and principals are looking around asking, how do we educate? And parents are looking to each other and asking, how do we educate? And, and it's really cool to have these types of services. I didn't even know about this one, Katie, until you told me about it. Uh, it's it's going to be great because, look, look, let's be honest. Our kids are going to get more screen time. Let's make sure it's useful. Now. Speaking of students, tell me about this uh, this graduation thing that you guys have going on, on June 6th. Oh, thank you for having this one. So this was um, recently announced. This is for, obviously, for many graduates. I think um, I have many in my family, others may as well. Um, graduation ceremonies in person have been canceled. So um, this is an event that is uh, under the YouTube Originals umbrella, and it will take place June 6th. It's a virtual commencement, so it's called Dear Class of 2020, and there'll be a number of different graduation speakers. So um, former Secretary Bob Gates, uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice, Malala, the Obamas, um, a number of really interesting and inspiring um, public leaders will be giving giving an address. Yeah, it, it's kind of nice, especially for for the students who have no graduation. I mean, I think all of us now look back at our senior years with, with incredible positive emotions and, and I kind of feel bad for the, the kids graduating today. Now, one of the other things that's connecting us is uh, keeping us abreast of news and information. And there's one place that we often always go to for the latest news and that's Twitter. Lauren, you know, how are, how are reporters leveraging um, a lot of this no stuff? How are you seeing their up to during Twitter, the COVID crisis? Um, very often to, to get their content out there. Um, and that's why our company made a major contribution to support journalism organizations during this time. And that's a major, major priority for us. Um, We've also just to support um, the people who are coming to Twitter to find information. We have an events page. So if you open the app, you'll see the latest COVID-19 information. Um, another thing and a, a great use case that we're seeing too is not only are leaders at the federal level um, using Twitter to get important information out to constituents, but we're also seeing a huge uptick in localization of content. So mayors are all over Twitter using it um, in really innovative ways to get the latest out. I know I, I follow um, Mayor Bowser here in DC for daily updates about what's going on here in the district, if you're here. Um, and to, to that end, our teams have been busy at work to try to support those efforts. Um, we've done tons of Q and A's with leaders, including 13 with governors, more than 20 with mayors, we just did a few, uh, I think there were over 20 with uh, state AGs, including DC, as well as our Attorney General um, Barr. And so it's been really uh, great to see uh, political leaders use Twitter to reach constituents directly and to have those really important conversations, whether it's health information or trying to prevent and get information about some frauds and scam. Uh, fraudulent, fraudulent activity and scams. Um, that's something that we're seeing across the board. And then I think another thing that we've, we've tried to do is to elevate uh, mental health 
During this time, we launched a mental health campaign leading heavily on partnerships with mental health organizations across the world uh, that launched last year, or last week rather, and uh, to help facilitate those conversations and to kind of let people know it's okay if you want to have these conversations and to talk about this right now. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I really love the idea of getting information out there because everyone is clamoring for it. It seems to be changing every moment. And it's great to have those quick updates. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one of the things that I did want to go back to for a moment was also local businesses. Now, I mentioned that uh, restaurant down the street that's really struggling. You know, Sarah, what, what is Pinterest really doing to help small businesses, local businesses, not just stay afloat, but find customers, tell people, hey, we're here and get people excited about their their stores. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks for asking. I think um, from the start, we've really seen users coming to Pinterest um, to turn their passions into, into businesses. Um, so we're really proud to see the groundswell of support that's happening right now for small businesses who are, who are really struggling and we're trying to help as well. Um, we've joined the Stand for Small Coalition with American Express and, and 40 other major companies. Um, we're also featuring small businesses, you can see here in our Pinterest shop. Um, so that's a profile dedicated to spotlighting mom and pop businesses across the country um, to bring to bring more attention to them. Um, and we're also providing some thought leadership and, and resources and tips to help small businesses reach their audiences right now. Um, I think we might have a slide. One of our pinners, Kaylin from New York. Here she is. She's um, she owns a stationery and gift shop called Effie's Paper, um, and she's home right now. Of course, she can't have her business open, unfortunately, um, but she's spending some time digging into Pinterest analytics and, and trying to figure out how to. Um, use the platform to best build her brand awareness for her shop. Um, so you can go go check her out. Um, and I think, like you know, Lauren mentioned and um, and Katie mentioned about how we're trying to also support government and and public health organizations. Something else that we're um, we're doing is really trying to help um, you know um, get out the messages that these organizations are trying to get out about COVID. Um, we've joined the Ag Council, the White House, the CDC, and HHS and others um, to. Uh, extend the reach of their critical COVID messaging. We've donated $800,000 in house media to expand the messages that, that they've been putting out and we've been you know, pushing it out in our own social channels. Um, and we're also helping um, public health orgs get their messages out through something we call expert search. So if you go onto Pinterest right now and you search for terms related to COVID-19, um, you're gonna get results from just public health organizations. So in the US, um, if you're a user in the US, you'll see content from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics and, and the WHO. Um, it's an effort, one, to make sure misinformation is not getting to our users um, through that search feature, um, but also really making sure we're helping get those messages out to, to users and really help amplify the messages that the public health organizations are trying to get out. Yeah, it's, it's great. Now, one of the slides that, uh, that Katie had shared with me, and I actually found this also on YouTube myself, is this uh, hashtag home with me. Now, uh, Katie, I'm going to ask you to explain to me what, what you guys are doing with this, but uh, th that graphic on the far left is particularly uh, emotional to me because my wife, and, and I, I've channeled her several times, but she learned to become a barber because she watched a video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Now, her her success or failures are, are up for, for you guys to decide, um, but but tell me about this uh, hashtag with me, stay home the with me stuff that you're great, doing. Carl. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll very you skilled. Um, this is an example of, uh, as you mentioned, a campaign um, with me. And so uh, you were talking about small businesses. I think, you know, we have creators across the platform that would all consider themselves small businesses, regardless of um, whether they're a comedian or, you know, whatever type of um, content vertical they may work in, you know, education, learning, um, et cetera. And so With Me is, um, is a campaign that's unified many different content creators on the platform um, across different spectrums, across different cities. So there are, especially as um, folks were uh, sheltering in place. Um, and health authorities were providing the guidance to also um, stay home for those that could. Um, and we're not essential workers. There are um, cook with me. I think some of you mentioned the mental health um, significance and importance. Um, it's, I think, Mental Health Awareness Month. And so, um, you know, meditate with me, finding um, authoritative information. It's a, a way to kind of 
link together and um, find like-minded people, whether it's um, information that would reduce stigma or surface public health content, um, just like another way to unify folks at this time. Excellent, excellent. So we, we, we've kind of had the, the fun, here's all the great things we're doing, but we do have a lot of people who ha have uh, signed in to learn about some of the sizzle, some of the, the more challenging aspects of this, and that gets into content moderation. Uh, you know, it's in the news almost every other day about some misinformation, disinformation, or misstatement that might be spreading, and how how we're going to kind of deal with that. Uh, Sarah, I know that you are were heavily involved in the drafting of policies to address this. Can you can you talk to us about what went through that? Any changes that you all had to make, and uh, similar steps? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. Um, my team writes the content policies for Pinterest um, and then works with our enforcement teams to, to make sure we can enforce them. So um, this is this is the this is what I do all day um, for better or worse. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, our mission, Pinterest mission is to bring people inspiration. Um, so people come looking for inspiring content on Pinterest, like how to make sourdough and um, how to you know set up your home office space right now. Um, but I think we all know not all content on the internet is very inspiring. Um, some of it really isn't inspiring. And uh, so that's why we have our content policies to try to outline what we do and don't allow on Pinterest. Um, this was be this was true before the pandemic, of course, and, and remains true today. Um, so the way we set up our content policies is we outline our, our values, our content policy values, and then we moderate content that violates those values. So, for example, um, you know, we we um, think that content that's harmful or hateful or violent is not inspiring. And so um, we would we would moderate that type of content. And then we determine what would get removed from the platform um, or what might just be limited in distribution based on how harmful it is. Um, so we work really hard to take that harmful, violating content off of Pinterest, but it, it is a hard job. Um, we use lots of different tools like I think everyone else does, like algorithms and um, tooling and manual review. Um, but I know it's, it's, it is hard and it's hard to keep hundred percent of it off, but no matter, no matter how hard we try. Um, but one example I can mention right now, that's, um, that's really a focus for our team right now is our uh, health misinformation policy. So we actually developed this back in 2017. Originally it was really focused on anti-vaccination content, mm -hmm. um, vaccine misinformation. Um, but it also includes, um, or prohibits other type of content like false cures, um, and uh, misinformation about public health uh, emergencies, which of course, you know, we're finding ourselves in right now. Um, so we, we originally had that policy in 2017. We've updated it a few times since then. Um, so because we have this policy in place already, we were actually able to move really fast on um, COVID misinformation as soon as we started seeing it appear. Um, and, you know, we don't have doctors on staff. My, my team does not have doctors. So we've turned to um, public health organizations. I think we've mentioned before, like the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics and and the WHO to try to make sure that we're um, we're drafting our policies and then enforcing them uh, to keep the most harmful health misinformation off the platform. Um, so one example of how this is is in play right now is um, we you know, ended up seeing um, for vaccines, for example, we ended up seeing a lot of vaccine misinformation. Um, no matter how hard we tried to keep it off the platform when people searched, it was really difficult to keep it out of the search results. So we actually, um, in 2018, ended up blocking search results for vaccine-related content. Um, mm -hmm. And then last year started serving content from the CDC and AAP and others in place of that. So people would get the expert content, it tries to help fill the data void that's out there, um, which is why misinformation is, is in part spreading and, and catching on. You know, It tends to be catchier than the authoritative dry content from, from public health experts. So we saw this as a way to try to combat that. Um, and we ended up doing the same thing in February, actually, um, with COVID-related content. We ended up serving um, content from the public health groups um, when people search for it. So now you see that, again, I think I mentioned earlier, when you search for COVID terms, you see this type of content. Um, and we've been expanding it. We, you know, it's kind of a constantly a game of trying to keep up with the different terms people are using to search for it, and we add those to the search experience. Um, but yeah, because we have this policy in place, uh, we were able to move pretty quickly. We didn't actually have to do a lot of updating of the policy, just trying to keep up with the trends and make sure the enforcement guidance was really clear for our teams. Um, so I think it just goes to show the importance of, of having those policies and, and always trying to keep up and um, developing them so that you're ready for something like this. So it sounds like, I mean, it's just an evolution because the way a lot of this gets reported out is 
COVID crisis, it's new, it's novel. This content moderation is something we haven't seen before. But what you're saying is you already have policies in place with regard to bad content and you just tweaked it a little bit? Is, yeah, is that help. fair? For us, yeah, I mean, I think every platform does a little bit differently. I mean, we've we've really been focused on health misinformation the past year or two. Um, so for us, that policy was actually already in place. Um, what wasn't in place was the really detailed enforcement guidelines and exactly what is misinformation about COVID because we didn't know about COVID-19 before, right? So um, for example, the public health emergency aspect of our of our policy would have applied for, if you start seeing misinformation of like an Ebola outbreak, we know that misinformation about public health emergencies is really dangerous. It can have really um, real world impact on health workers who are trying to combat a public health emergency. Um, so the policy was in place. We just had to make sure that we were keeping up with the trends and putting together that very detailed guidance for our teams who were trying to keep out, you know, keep a lookout for it and, and know when to take something down. Excellent, excellent. Katie, uh, I mean, I'm sure you see similar problems at, at YouTube. One of the things that Sarah mentioned was that uh, kind of trying to get the good information out there. Can you kind of talk about some of the challenges that you all have been facing and, and some of the information sure. that you're trying um, to get out there? You know, very, very similar um, in some ways in that YouTube does have uh, community guidelines and we have policies um, that are public. So that would be policies that prohibit um, mature content, bullying, harassment, hate speech, violent extremism. Um, if you do a search for um, YouTube community guidelines or YouTube um, community enforcement, um, you can see on a quarterly basis, um, pretty interesting data that will show um, what actions we're taking against the different policies. So it'll be in a pie chart and it can show you kind of relative based on the policies um, on a quarterly kind of real time basis. I, the last time I checked it was um, for the quarter prior, um, 6 million videos removed, 2 million channels, over 500 million comments um, across all the different policies. Um, I do think you know one of the places that has needed to be adapted to um, are, um, you know, health misinformation uh, that could kind of negatively impact someone's health. So YouTube has always had a policy that um, prohibits content that encourages dangerous or illegal activities um, that would pose kind of a serious health risk, risk of serious harm or death. And that's a policy that has been applied, you know, for a while. Um, when we now look at kind of COVID, one place that that, um, that policy can apply would be um, if content is um, uploaded that, you know, explicitly has a call to action to violate a local health authority guidance about social distancing or the WHO guidance in a way that could cause real death or illness to, um, to another person, that's the type of content that could fall under that policy. So um, we do think kind of the transparency around what the policies are and how often we're taking action against them is, is really important. Um, it's always, in terms of like the systems, a mixture of automated um, removals, human um, reviews, uh, external flagging from users or from um, kind of trusted flaggers who might be law enforcement or, or NGOs in that space. And um, I always find the report really interesting because it'll kind of break it down um, on those levels as well. And, and you can also see the increasing percentage of content that's struck um, before actually any viewers ever see it. So that's now the majority because the AI based on kind of machine learning and classifiers has become so strong that um, the YouTube system is able to eliminate that material before it is even uploaded. Um, you know, I think the, the only other thing I'd add is, I think the removing of the harmful content is important, um, but so is elevating the, the authoritative content. And so I, I know that's another place, you know, our, my colleagues in search have worked extremely hard on this to surface authoritative information across the search, um, YouTube as well. So we have a news shelf on the homepage um, where authoritative news journalists um, and news outlets have video content that's there. Um, are also information cards that would trigger if someone's doing a kind of a COVID related search. I think there's been uh, 20 billion impressions that were surfaced based on those um, types of queries to give uh, connection as quickly as possible to kind of whatever the local health Yeah, you, you can are, kind of see it at the bottom of uh, that video with 
Dr. Fauci, you know, get more information here on, on COVID-19. Um, Lauren, one of the things, Twitter actually has a really illustrative slide, which I found uh, quite good with regard to how you guys react to content moderation issues. Uh, can you can you kind of walk me through this matrix that you guys have? I mean, you can you can search the Twitter rules, um, but just yeah. like most platforms, we do have guidelines, rules, and we um, take action based on those. Um, and in mid March, we recognized that with a public health crisis, we need to make we needed to make sure that people who came to Twitter could trust the information they were getting. So we hit this on two ends. So one, as I described, and I think this is something that um, we've all hit on as important is making sure that we're elevating authoritative sources of, of information so people have access to that best, uh, very credible um, information. On the flip side, we recognize that there is harmful misinformation, especially um, information that includes some sort of call to action that would lead to offline harm. So we really prioritize that content. So back in March, we expanded our harmful content policy to include COVID mis misinformation, again, with that focus on call to actions that could lead to offline harm. Um, and then yesterday, we announced that in addition to content removal, we're also looking at um, and will implement uh, labeling of content that falls within this category. So as, as you pointed out, this is a uh, matrix to kind of help uh, walk you through how we're thinking about this and we'll take action. So if there is uh, misleading information that is severely harmful, we will probably remove that um, for less um, for less harmful, but misleading, we might label it. Um, same with disputed claims. Um, and, and with uh, unverified claims, we won't necessarily take action, but we might if things change. And I think one thing, and this is a new, this is a new and evolving a uh, challenge with the crisis. And it's also a challenge that the information around uh, COVID um, continues to evolve as we all learn about the disease um, and um, and how all, everything, uh, you know, is, is playing out. And so this is a constantly moving target. So we're trying to stay on top of it. And so we think this system will give us some flexibility to address it. Yeah, I mean, that kind of gets back to the whole notion of your ability to moderate content. Now, you know, whether you see this as a mandate on on yourselves because you are a business, whether you see it as a mandate because you're just, you know, Americans or, or people of, of humanity or something like that, you engage in content moderation. And, and you know, Katie, how important is your ability to engage in content um, moderation in general to engage has been been critical at this time um you know especially to lead a community that that does have responsible guidelines um you know there there can be a difference between um content that's encouraging users yeah to swallow bleach or misinformation if you take turmeric or oregano you will be cured of covid versus um, really legitimate debate about economic recovery, um, various kind of measures governments take where you want in a democracy a robust debate and, and different opinions that um, of course should stay up and wouldn't, wouldn't fall under a violation of the policies. So, um, you know, I think it is quite interesting that, that even around the world, there are a lot of global citizens that are turning to platforms that kind of grew up in the U.S., um, I think we would kind of directly credit the, the foresight of the U.S. Congress, um, of kind of U.S. law for, for giving platforms this breathing space to innovate, to be able to have this really compelling, you know, user ability or by various sector ability to upload content in real time. It has been critical at this time to surface um, important news information or to just um, make somebody laugh, you know, in, in a hard moment. Um, I've been learning uh, many new recipes, you know, looking, looking at YouTube. So both on the ability to have users engaging from whether it's comments or links and search um, or reviews, that breathing space in US law has been really important. But similarly, the kind of good Samaritan moderation 
protections that platforms have that um, do give platforms the certainty that we can take action when content does violate our policies. Um, you can imagine when someone's video disappears, they are unhappy about that. So there's many instances in which if someone's link is removed from search because it was spammy or if a, if a YouTube video disappeared, um, you know, there could be uh, many, many different um, court cases, litigation. This affects, I think, small platforms even probably more than, than us. But um, having that certainty that we can take action um, and keep the platform safe has been really important. Keep the platform safe, keep people safe. If they can't reliably trust the stuff they read, they might not do it. If I can't trust that the built-in cabinets I'm gonna build on, on Pinterest are gonna at least kind of look at the way they do in the pictures, then I'm gonna I'm not gonna use that information. And and I think that's really important. Whether it's addressing stuff like COVID, I, I remember we had the Tide Pod challenge a couple of years ago. Hopefully that's over. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to be one of the things that makes us want to use the services. So that's, that's really great. One of the things I do want to always try to figure out is how do we expect this to play out? Not just two months from now, but let's say three years from, you know, two or three years from now, once, once people are at least hopefully getting back to some degree of normalcy in their lives. I mean, uh, we're, we're seeing users log in 12 to 16 hours a day. We're seeing uh, time on these services increase. Are you expecting people to just abandon everything and go back to the way things were? Are we entering into a, a new age on this? I mean, Lauren, Lauren, what do you think the future bodes for? Sure, for we, we always uh, try to Twitter focus on, on the quality of the time that people spend on our service um, over the quantity, because we think that's the most important. Um, but certainly people are spending more time online these days. Um, I think just down the road, one um, benefit um, to our industry and content moderation in general is we have had to make some shifts and changes in how we leverage technology in ways that we hadn't tested before and so um, it's our hope that our that systems will be better for it down the line i want to be clear though um, technology is not the only thing that uh, we could deploy for content moderation at this point um, there's still a lot of context that requires a human element um, so it, it's not a silver bullet however um, some of the, the experiments or things that we've had to do to get creative during this time um, we think that it, it's possible that these will um, help us do this work in a more efficient and in a better way uh, moving forward. Yeah, uh, Sarah, Pinterest, I mean, you guys seem to be growing, people seem to be loving it. I mean, do you think you're gonna be making changes to the service? How do you think you're gonna be improving the service kind of going forward based on what people think and, and like? Yeah, I mean, I think hopefully, you know, people are still going to be looking for inspiration after the the you know they're able to get back out in the world after the pandemic hopefully winds down um and as we all try to kind of figure out what that new normal is going to look like we hope people will keep turning to pinterest for inspiration um and you know we're we're already actually seeing a shift people are starting to start looking for um future oriented searches like planning that trip out even if it's a year oh, or two down the road and, and not now um, and we know even anecdotally that planning for the future really does help um, build optimism for people and reduce anxiety. So, yeah, we hope people will keep, I mean, you know, obviously keep coming to Pinterest to, um, to plan their future and, and plan ideas for their lives and, and find that inspiration. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll continue um, with some of the features, you know, hopefully that people are finding those useful now, like the Today tab and um, Compassionate Search and, you know, just keep thinking about new ways to, to help um, and, and bring that inspiration to our pinners. And, and Katie, as somebody who deals with governments across the world, I mean, do you expect to see kind of some some positive feelings coming from our governmental leaders with respect to tech? I know it's easy to complain when times are good, but seeing how tech has really helped to stabilize us during this crisis, do you see those good are, feelings kind of hanging around for a bit? Familiar. With the technologies now um i think you know we've seen even recently on youtube the danish prime minister um issuing kind of press briefings or chancellor merkel or merkel 
um, many uh, uh, elected officials across the U.S., state, local, federal, um, are using YouTube to communicate with their constituents. And so I, I hope that there is a benefit, the closer kind of, um, you might even say like a regulator is to the service. And I think that could be very constructive in that sometimes there's goals of legislation, but they have unintended consequences. And the, um, I think the more familiar the policymakers are with some of the benefits or also the downsides, it can hopefully be um, kind of increasingly data-driven um, and informed policymaking. Um, you know, a couple, I think, of the trends that we're seeing for the future already kind of across the platform is this um, real embrace of live streaming. So um, I think before maybe it was something that more sophisticated kind of content distributors were really focused on, but maybe not your everyday channel or maybe not your local city council um, or maybe not the theater. And so we really tried to consolidate a lot of that learning and um, put it out there for everyone in terms of there's like YouTube creator academies or um, the digital playbook that I mentioned that kind of does walk through step by step. And so um, it will be interesting, you know, as some of the shelter in place orders over time are hopefully um, ease to keep the components that, that did work well in terms of um, introducing old historic archives to users or using those things like live streaming. Um, I think we've even seen, you know, uh, more traditional cultural institutions, but also um, religious institutions have actually been really uh, using some of these more kind of cutting edge features. So um, Sunday service, I think I mentioned the, the Easter service, but also, you know, Passover seders or um, Ramadan right now and, and calls to prayer use it really um, using these, um, these tools to connect, um, you know, with communities in real time will be uh, quite interesting. Great. Well, we did have some questions coming from, uh, from some of our webinar attendees. We sent out a survey to our friends on the Hill to ask if they had questions before we got going. Uh, there was one that came in on uh, questions about promotion of breaking social distancing guidelines. I think we kind of addressed that when we went through the, the matrices you guys use to identify whether something's high threat, low threat. One that we hadn't yet addressed um, was in light of the recent surge of online child pornography, could you discuss efforts to protect children from coming across sexually explicit material? Are there regulations or other obstacles that make your efforts more difficult? Um, Katie, Lauren, Sarah, one of you want to talk about what you guys do to, to remove essentially uh, sure. sexually explicit start, material uh, and of protect it's, children? You know, illegal from per seeing se. that type stuff? Um, so prohibited on our, our platforms, and I will assume you know, everyone on this call is something um, I think from our leadership on down has been incredibly important. Um, the community guidelines enforcement report that I mentioned actually has some pretty interesting stats about um, that type of material and, and the volume at which it's been taken down. We work um, very closely with NCMEC um, and I think provide you know, technology assistance, um, also obviously refer uh, when we do come across that content, um, refer to NCMEC, refer to law enforcement where appropriate. Um, I think you know one of the the more positive breakthroughs recently has been on the machine learning side. So using classifiers to identify materials so that it's never um, exposed and never sees an audience. Um, we've seen some pretty remarkable um, increases in the amount of content that can be proactively detected, proactively removed before anyone sees it um, based on that machine learning. And so there's a tool, it's called um, CSAI Match that I think a number of our partners in the industry and NGOs have used. Um, that was built, uh, which has been. Um, yeah, um, similar to what Katie said, and this is an issue that actually just historically, many of the trust and safety teams or companies uh, were started uh, on this issue. Um, I know it is true at Twitter. Um, so our leadership, there are folks who have dedicated their careers to combating child sexual exploitation or uh, the exploitation of children. Um, this is something that our teams work very diligently on and work um, with industry um, around with, with our peer companies on. And so obviously the current framework um, is really important 
uh, for our teams to do this work. Um, and as Katie, Katie mentioned, you know, it is illegal content and we t have very zero tolerance rules against this. And when we are aware of it, we report it to NCMEC um, as required by current law. And um, we consider a lot of organizations who work in this space, including NCMEC as great partners of ours. Um, to that end, we, we recognize, um, and we, we've heard the reports just like a lot of you have, that because kids are spending more time online, there are certainly more threats and we're, we're aware of that. Um, and, it, and one thing we're doing right now is we're working with our partners to help elevate um, some of the educational work that they've done um, around this to make sure that parents and families um, have the resources they need to help prevent this type of activity. So we've provided ads for good grants, so pro bono advertising credits to help get that information out there. We've also helped to elevate some of their on-platform activations to educate on this issue. Sorry, I just was remembering that you had also, I think, um, as you read off the question, okay. the question was oh, go ahead, Katie. Um, about are there other existing kind of proposals that would um, enhance that work? So, I mean, I think um, in the first instance, always making sure law enforcement has the resources yeah. they need. This is illegal um, activity. So to um, make sure that, you know, especially the federal government um, and any other authorities are empowered. There also was, um, I think this is still an ongoing debate, but there's some proposals about retention. So there's kind of minimum thresholds for retention of this information. And I think um, what I've heard from some of the child safety experts is that extending that retention period by some number of days or months could be useful in terms of retaining it um, to assist law enforcement or also to um, continue to improve the machine learning on it because otherwise, um, I think the platforms are obligated under law to to purge um, themselves of it in a pretty short period of time. Okay, as we come up on on the end of the hour, I want to leave everyone with kind of positive thoughts. So I'm going to kind of go around the horn and ask our panelists. Uh, we're going to go Sarah, Lauren, Katie. So begin thinking, and Katie, you get the most amount of time to think. One thing that you think is really cool about what you guys are doing or people should check out or uh, some really cool aspect of what your company's engaged in that we might not know about. So Katie, a good example for you would have been the educational resources available for us parents. I didn't know about that on YouTube. So you can't use that one, but think of a new one. Uh, Sarah, what's one thing we should all go and check out as soon as we're done? Um, well, because I have to go first, I'm going to give you two, um, to make, to make up for that. So, um, yeah, I would say expert search. I think that's probably number one. Um, we've all hit on the kind of like twofold difficulty of this conflict uh, or this pandemic. Um, that it's really hard to keep the bad information off of the platforms, but incredibly important right now, the misinformation that might be harmful to, you know, people or, or public health. Um, and then how to get the good information out there. Um, and an example of how we're trying to do that is what we call expert search. So, um, if you go on to Pinterest um, from you know your phone or from your computer, you can search a coronavirus-related term. Um, and if you find one that we haven't found, please let me know. Um, but when you search for that on Pinterest, it will bring up expert content. And so right now, if you're in the U.S., you'll see content from um, the WHO, the CDC, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. If you're in different countries, you might see content from your health ministry or, or the European CDC, for example. Um, this is something we did with vaccines before. So that's one way. And I think the second I would mention is our compassionate search, um, which now is, is available both on mobile and web. So if you're feeling anxious or you're searching for things like stress relief, um, you can you can type that in and you'll see the different activities that come up there. So it's like a collection of emotional well-being activities to, to help you manage your emotions or, or relax. Um, and that was developed with, um, with emotional health, um, health experts. So um, everyone's kind of feeling extra anxiety right now and maybe, you know, a little stress about the future or, um, or your situation. Um, so you can check those out and, um, and hopefully they, they help you manage your emotions. Um, so yeah, those would be the two things I'd mention. Okay. Lauren. Uh, I think you might be muted there, Lauren. Okay. 
Um, well, by the way, yeah, if you go to go. covid19.twitter.com, okay, that's covid19.twitter.com, we have a hub for for everything COVID related, whether it's enforcement or things that we're doing, partnerships. Um, one thing I wanted to draw attention to, because obviously um, the opioid crisis in the United States um, is certainly still um, you know, something that's happening in our backyards and it's really important to Twitter. Um, and we've done a lot of work to support people in recovery. And this is a time where we recognize that, and I, I have a family member who's impacted by this, um, this is a tough time for those folks. Um, and so a lot of the resources have moved online. And so we've banded together with our partners um, at Facebook, uh, Google, through CSIP, um, through our Tech Together effort, which is to help support people in recovery and to help uh, with the opioid crisis. We've created a hub at that site. That's techtogether.co, um, where it has online resources uh, for, to help people in recovery, whether it's uh, virtual meetings, um, doc, uh, different tests, um, things like that. So um, check that out and share it with family or friends. And also don't forget to text them or tweet them or send them a, a nudge if, if that's something that um, if you have an, a loved one in that position right now. Okay, Katie, your last but not least, go ahead. Thanks. Well, it, you mentioned the um, kids learning, which um, I should have also mentioned YouTube Kids. Uh, if there's any kind of parents watching, that's kind of a standalone app that has content that's also curated for kids. But I think also in the kind of education and learning space for adults, um, going to the Learning Hub is actually pretty remarkable. Um, any topic or skill that you'd be interested in learning is there. I um, recently read a story about um, a man named Josh Carroll. He is from West Virginia. He um, had obtained his GED, and he's a veteran. He had deployed three times um, on behalf of the United States, and he returned, and he was um, working his day job, and he was uh, uh, seeking kind of YouTube videos um, in the evenings, and he started watching um, a lot of physics videos, and he's now a professional physicist um, after all that time. So I think you know, that's just one example, but we are in a time when industries are shifting. Um, we understand that, you know, the U.S. economy um, will face challenges. Um, and so, you know, I think there are many people out there that are interested in um, updating their skills or learning new skills, um, especially as they may be thinking about, um, uh, you know, kind of where they will be in, in the workforce. So. I think that learning hub, um, not just for kids, but for adults can be um, really fascinating. And then the last thing I'd mention, because um, it's a show I recently came across, um, uh, Some Good News is uh, John Krasinski has been uploading from his home and it's the good news of the day. Um, so if anyone out there is yeah. an office fan, mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a good one too. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate it. A lot to, a lot to take home, uh, whether you're going to learn more about the virus, you're going to go do some building you saw on Pinterest, you're going to go become a physicist in professional life. I really love it. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to sit down with me and uh, help us all learn about what's going on out there and what steps you guys are, are taking. And uh, if we had a live audience, I'd say, please give a round of applause. So I'm sure they're doing it virtually. Thanks again, everyone, and have a good day. Thanks, Carl. Bye. Thanks so much, everyone.